Well, hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver and to another adventure of The Shrink and the Pundit where I, Jeff the Pundit, talk with my good buddy, integral psychotherapist extraordinaire, Dr. Keith Witt, The Shrink on all things integral. Hey, brother Keith. Brother Jeff, it is always so good to see you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the topic today is, I, 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 you sent me some stuff and you sent me some thoughts, and I got to say, I'm not sure I get it. I'm going to ask you to introduce it, but I like the big general category, and that is truth. Yes. Because this, we're living in a, tooth, a truth-challenged moment. Yeah, uh, this is the what uh, week two after the election, mm-hmm. and um, or the end of the following week rather, and uh, we have Trump and all of the horseshit that's going on, and I need some help, honestly, Aww, Jeff. So go for it. Truth. <laughs> what is truth default theory? Well, first of all, what's distressing? What's distressing about these two weeks? What are you distressed about? Well, um, I could both see it and be it, uh, Mm -hmm. but what's distressing is to see, you know, and I'm the, uh, evolution is beautiful, but not pretty guy. So, you know, you are, I actually give a lot of latitude to the culture wars and to fighting and all of that stuff. I see the fruitfulness of it. And with that said, I am, um, I'm frightened and upset by the fact that we have a psychopath in the White House, and I don't say that as an insult, but as a diagnosis that I'm absolutely sure about. Yeah, a descriptor. It, yeah, it a descriptor. Is. Very and accurate. And that um, is upsetting to me. So yes, I'm upset. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you, you mentioned that you, your clients are all upset. You know, you're, you're yeah, and, and psychotherapy, and you know, this is in the air. I've had more political conversations in my therapy sessions pretty much in the last month than I've had any time in the last 40 years, okay? Um, 40 plus years. Uh, uh, and, it, and also, I got scared too. I, I was more scared before the election. Um, I'm less scared since Biden won on Saturday. Um, though, the reason that we're talking about truth is at least that I wanted to talk about truth, is that I went 72, apparently, million American adult voters apparently voted, um, maybe not consciously, but for fascism over democracy. Um, Now, I understand that they were voting against progressives who they see as dangerous, which I, I understand that when we've mobilized a group as dangerous, they lose credibility to a certain extent. Okay, I got that. I get it that um, their worldviews see Trump as as taking a stand against their enemies. Um, Okay, I've got that. I know when people are scared, they want a strong leader. I got that. That being said, that, that scared me more. I was more scared than I was in 68 and 69. And, you know, that's a big statement. You know, 68 and 69, they were drafting us and sending us over to get killed in Vietnam. Uh, and so if I'm more scared now than I was then, then there, there's something, now there's something different about me. I identify more with the country, frankly. I'm, you know, I'm more of a, of a patriot, I guess, in, in the sense of um, I care about America. I was proud of America. United States on Saturday, that that we actually voted uh, uh, an authoritarian uh, a personality type, um, a dictator type, out of office, and that and that he's going to go out of office even though he's blatantly doing third world Mugabe type machinations. Yeah. Uh, but it, but it got me thinking about okay, what is it about deception? What is it about um, credibility. Um, how, how does that affect how we understand each other and relate with each other and evaluate each other? And I'm, I'm, I was tired of opinions about yeah. it. So I, I wanted to find the most intensely rigorous, 
deception and truth geek I could possibly find. And I found a couple of them, okay? Wonderful. I found, Thank you. I found, I found two truth geeks. Um, Timothy Levine, who wrote Duped, and a guy named Stephen McCormick, who came up with information manipulation theories one and two. That's my kind of a truth yeah. geek, okay? Yeah, yeah. And so Stephen Levine said, I want to know, he, 20, 30 years ago, how do you tell if people are lying? What makes people lie? What is lies? What are lies? How are they enacted? What motivates people to lie? What motivates people to believe lies? Um, what motivates people to tell the truth? And so he and he didn't just do single studies because there's been lots of single studies that show things like, well, you know, if you avoid eye contact, you're lying. Well, it, he looked at like hundreds of studies, did a meta-analysis, and found out that all the things we associate with lying, like fidgeting, stumbling over words, oh, where were you last night? Oh, Mr. Adel, I, I don't know. You like, oh, you must be lying. You know, or, you know, I don't know, Jeff, I avoid eye contact or right. voice changes. None of those things predict lying, okay? None of them. Uh, there's only two things that even predict lying a little bit. And they only, and they only increase your, credit, your ability from 54%, which is normal to tell a lie, to about 65%. One of them is that your voice goes up when you're telling a lie. Really? Yeah. You know, Jeff? The, the sun rose in the west in the west this morning in Santa Barbara. Is this still rising in the east in, in Boulder? You know, you notice how my voice went up a little bit? Like I'm uh -huh. not a liar, okay? And the other one is your pupils dilate a little hmm. bit when you lie. But those aren't reliable. Now, what, what makes people credible to us is another interesting thing. There is a guy named Greece, uh, G-R-I-C-E. -I, -I, I don't know if I pronounce his name. He has four maxims. And he said, we find people credible or not, according to four things. One, um, the quantity of the information that they give. You know, our, our people tend to, the biggest, most common lies are lies by omission. So you're not giving enough. Or sometimes, if you don't want somebody to catch the lie, you just give way too much information. Okay, so there's there's the quantity of information. There's quality. Well, of actually, oh. let me just pause sure. there. Uh, the The it's one of the things that I've noticed when you talk about quant just sheer quantity of information that it surprised me when I actually started looking in, into conspiracy theories because I always thought these were sort of vague imaginings. They're not. They're full of detail and precision and charts yes. and graphs and, you know, all of these things that, I mean, I watched a documentary on the trade towers and I think George Bush did bring them down. You know, I, yes. I, you know, you could read these things and, and I'm convinced. Right. And, and, and it's the surf feet of information that actually is a feature of conspiracy theories. Okay, so th this is how lies happen. So someone then will talk to somebody else or write something and they have an agenda. They have a purpose. I want to make Bush look bad. And so they start, they give this conspiracy theory and then they start elaborating on it. And the bias is to tell the truth. You know that the Bush has existence. His incoming administration um, had arrogant disregard for the intelligence estimates of the previous one. That's all been documented. The towers did go down. People prefer to tell the truth. But then when they run into a problem where the truth doesn't work, um, they have an impulse to solve the problem by lying, usually by omission, the most common lie. But if they can't do it by omission, it'll be by commission. And then they'll tell that lie. And at that point, you know, think Sean Hannity. At that point, then they're kind of stuck on that path. And I want to get to the end goal. The end goal is he brought it down in a conspiracy. And now I'm looking for data to support it. I got confirmation bias. I'm ignoring and avoiding data that goes against it. Um, lots of it, but I'm ignoring that. That's by omission. Quantity is one of, of, of Grice's ma maxims. The second one is quality. The third one is relevance. Uh, relevance is that sometimes when people are making a point, and, I'm, and now I'm going to people with, with an agenda, they will bring in, they will bring in um, random data 
that's not relevant to what you're talking about, but it's designed to predispose you to believe their point. And usually that's designed to have you blame the other person or see the other person as dangerous. So it's not enough that there's a cabal trying to control the world. They, they're pedophiles and, you know, cannibals, try, you know, you know, <laughs> trying to control the world. Right. And the final one is manner. And this is, by the way, how we evaluate other people. It's manner. And manner is, do you seem friendly and empathic? Do you seem sincere? Or do you seem righteously angry at the people I'm angry at? Bill O'Reilly, good example. Um, I have a cousin who really likes to put people down. He loved Bill O'Reilly. Why? Bill O'Reilly was his guy attacking the people he liked to attack, putting people down, and so on. He liked to do that. He wasn't feeling personally threatened. Instead, he was riding along the Bill O'Reilly attack train, having a good time. And Or he, he saw Bill O'Reilly as, um, as credible, as empathetic to, to him. Now, there's context involved in this, and this is where Integral makes this super interesting. We have interior biases about what, who and what we find credible, and we have cultural pressures about, what, about who and what we, we find credible. And if those biases can be manipulated, um, and this is at every level, all the way up through Integral, because they're unconscious. It's not just in, the, in Amber. There's a, there's a subtle interior standard about that. But then there's the exterior about, will my, my social group be approve or disapprove of me believing this person? Um, for instance, I, there was a very credible scientist who did, did a series of meta-analysis on masks. And he found that with viruses or virons, when you're talking about individual viruses, that basically masks um, had 3% effectiveness, the ones that he was seeing in terms of blocking free-floating virons in an in, in environment. Uh, he said, yes, there are larger transmission vectors that are blocked by masks, you know, droplets and all that kind of stuff. So I mentioned that one to somebody I was talking with randomly while I was waiting for the pool, and they got pissed off at me. Now, I was wearing a mask when I started talking about it, and I thought, okay, I'm not going to discuss that research with people because the culture around me is going to be disapproving of me being interested in that data. And also, I do believe in, in masks. I personally think that that, da that data um, didn't take into account um, titer of viruses. Yeah. Um, I, 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 the data, to me, is very, very powerful that a mask dramatically reduce, reduces the titer of a virus that's expelled by the, by the person. So I'll wear a mask, and, and I'm happy to do it, and, and I feel like I'm protected by it. But that's how context, my yeah. interior context and the exterior context, so I I, I'm, I'm still trying to get my arms around this thesis that the, the, so we have these four things, quantity of information, quality of information, relevance of information, mm -hmm. and manner in which it's delivered. Those four things mm -hmm. um, reveal what? Whether or not we believe? Or yes, those okay. will influence whether we believe. And if, if you want to manipulate me mm -hmm. to believe something, you need to manipulate those qualities in me, mm -hmm. okay? And, and this now deals with intent, okay? People prefer to tell the truth. There, if you do look at a distribution of human beings, you know, there's this famous study that showed people lied on average of two times a day, okay? Or they lied of an average of um, once out of every three 10-minute conversations. And, and I thought that was credible data. If you break that data down, you find out that there's a few pathological liars, Trump being one of them, who lie all the time. Okay, so they just screw up the distribution. As it turned out, 1% of people account for 25% of the lies. 5 That's very of people, interesting. 5% of people account for 50%. Most people tell the truth almost yeah. all the time. Yeah, I, I was just uh, reading a book that made the, the case. It's humankind, by the way. The thesis is that human beings have become successful not because of our ability to uh, struggle against each other, but because we were friendly. Yes. And he calls us homo puppy. 
I love it. He does this analysis of history that shows that, yes, it's more violent as you go back, but the violence was committed by maybe one out of 20 people, all the violence. And the rest of us were actually pretty nice. That distribution is not uh, consistent among the population at all. It's It's remarkably not consistent. It's it's genetically driven, truth default. There's credible evidence that human beings self-domesticated between 50 and 70,000 years ago because they were very, very successful in Africa. There are lots and lots and lots of tribes. And the people that were able to communicate more collaboratively and cooperatively had an, an evolutionary edge. And during that period of time, human beings became enormously more collaborative and cooperative, and we still are. Yeah. We, we, we prefer to believe, we, pr- we prefer yeah. to tell the well, truth. Well, that was when you sent me this information, that, that uh, the thing that stuck with me is that people tend to believe whatever, what other people are saying is true. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. You me know? too. I, and, I, and I think that I, it's absolutely, um, it's true for me. And this is what is so vexing about Trump is that, so I, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be a good integralist, Keith. So, you know, not only am I watching Fox, which in Fox is they're all befuddled right now because they're in the crossfires of everything. But so I'm still watching some of that, but also the Newsmax and looking mm-hmm. at this new media that's built around, you know, Trumpism, basically. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and then hearing the, uh, the arguments about the observers, and again, it's like, well, maybe, maybe there is something to this. And, and so that really challenges my, the whole liberal line that is just so consistent and clear on the other side, that there's nothing to see here. And um, they can't both be true. You know, this is this this is where it gets dark. Yeah. Okay. This is where this is where it legitimately gets dark, and this is my now this is Keith's reading of the situation. My belief about the situation is that the Republican representatives do not represent the Republican electorate. They represent the donor class that supports them, and so their purpose is supporting their donor class. And to do that, they need to manipulate truth to their electorate. Their donor class is doing really well with the current economy and doesn't want it to change. They believe legitimately, not legitimately, but they genuinely believe that if they make the call that things are going to be better and that they have more capacity and they have more rights than the other people and they want to have representatives help them with that. And to do that, they have to manipulate the truth. Okay, and to do that, what they have to do is make you afraid of the other, because if you're afraid of the other, or if you're contemptuous of the other, even if you, the other is doing all four of those things, which Obama did routinely, you're going to dis- dismiss them categorically. Okay, and so progressives are playing right into the hands of, of conservatives when MSNBC has an implicit agenda to not trust conservatives, and to, to, to categorically dismiss conservative ideology. The, now, they're doing, now, I think that they're altruistically motivated, but I think that they've now bought into the system well, they, and they'll yeah. lose in that I mean, system. they're altruistically motivated, many of them on the right, too. And I'll argue for that. Uh, uh, name but, a few. Yeah, well, actually, I've got to let the dogs in. Hang on one second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, you know, I was thinking, like, Colin Powell... Okay, yep. but, but who are some others, some other altruistic conservatives? I mean, well, I mean, I think my family back home who love Trump are, in a way, in the oh, sense okay. that, you know, they're actually operating from good faith. Okay. They actually think that by supporting Trump that they will make the world better for their grandchildren. Really? Yeah, okay. they do. And, and, and I think actually most Trump supporters do. This is where... I separate Trump, Trump from Trump supporters because yes, we have Trump to. himself is, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I question his psyche in the sense of, you know, I, I do think it sort of hovers around red and that egocentric stage. It's actually pre-truth. We've talked yes. about this before. Developmentally, rationality hasn't come online yet, really. I mean, 
for if you're born in you know the, the, this era, of course, you become rational in certain ways, but your heart stays down where things just arise as true. So does does Trump actually believe that there has been a great conspiracy that is funded by George Soros and China or whatever the fuck he's saying, and that he actually actually won by a landslide? And um, or does he just think that there are people who are at a pre-truth developmental stage in, in the sense that they prefer great myths and great warrior leaders more than they prefer laws and all this complicated bullshit where everybody gets to say what they have to say and there's a separation of powers and everything's anxiety provoking, you know these people uh, believe that. So they, there's going to be, you know, it's like welcome to the great conspiracy of the, of the 2020 election that will survive you and me in this lifetime. And that's heartbreaking to me, for one thing. I'm just nauseated by it. You know? Well, so psychologically, the moral level that he's at is if I get away with it, it's moral. Absolutely. And, and when it's he's red using the tools, he, he sees how orange works. He knows what levers yeah. to pull, and he is good with a lot of it, but it's operating from red, which is what serves me. And that's why he's a pathological liar. He's one of those 1% of people that are responsible for 25% of the, of the lies. Um, what is it, 17 a day on average and 155 yeah. on, his, on his best day, September yeah. and September What an example 14th. he's been to us, Keith. Uh, what a great example this man has been. I mean, if we survive him, Jesus, Lord. Yeah. Anyway. God. So is he considering whether it's true or not? Not at all. He's just considering whether, whether the utility of it and in the power dynamics, whether he can promote it uh, successfully. So in those 2,500 lawsuits, it doesn't matter whether he's right or wrong. It just matters whether he's going to win the lawsuit. And if he's going to win the lawsuit, he's fine. Um, there, there's, there, there's nothing deeper than that. There's yeah. no there, there. It's, well, it's, even if he loses the lawsuit, he'll be fine in the sense that, um, you know, he'll just say that was a fraud and go on with the show. And, um, and there will be his, um, I don't know, 30% of the population that will believe him. 30%, 30, 70%, 60 to 70% of Republicans believe yeah. that, he, that the election yeah. Which got is about 30% of the population. That is such a shocking statistic. Yeah. And an indictment. It's an indictment of our culture's educational system. Well, it's an uh, indictment. It's, it is, Jeff, it's an indictment. Our country is not taking good enough care of its children if 3% of the people that have come of age in the last 50 years could believe that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I actually think there's a lot of truth to that. I think our education system could be improved in yeah. many ways. But I, I, I'm, I'm, my thought theory still is is that it's just developmental it's like actually if you have a pre-modern heart that is a traditional heart where god's in his heaven and you're in this world and you want and your job is to make the, the beautiful world in god's image and for your grandchildren and that sort of thing and that this whole big um blob of modernity and and you know experts and their masks and their you know, pornography and all of the ways in which they are dismissive of you. And, um, and, and, and then speaking of grandchildren, you're heartbroken because your grandchildren don't live next door and down the street. And this whole world that you think is the world that it, as it should be, where men and men and women are women. This is a beautiful vision, Keith. It's a just of modern. All. That's all. It's it's it, so they they. I agree the with guy that. Who is their champion? And uh, and and they they forgive him as as we all do. We forgive the psychopaths who are on our side, actually, and have to share our worldview. Yeah, a dirty lot Harry. Then we forgive the psychopaths on the other side. It's the dirty Harry syndrome. You know, if they're shooting the people we want them to shoot, we love them. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And he's That's out true. there in this. I mean, this culture has gone so modern and postmodern and global and multicultural. And uh, there's nothing left for me, you know. 
So I, you I demonstrate. Get it. I do. I, I and I I just dispositionally don't want to feel like. 30 to 47, the 30 percent Trump lovers, 47 percent who voted for him are bad, stupid, wrong, uneducated. I don't think that. I don't think that, Jeff. I, I don't. I and I think what you're doing, what you're demonstrating now is what I finally have concluded from this. What I've concluded from this is that progressives in general have way more capacity for empathic resonance with with red and or with red, red and amber and orange, um, than red and amber and orange have to, to for empathic capacity with green and teal. And so my job is to offer empathy as you're doing and not demand it in return. That's right. one of my jobs. And to do that, I need to, to to recognize when I feel contempt, that's my problem and I need to take care of it. Um, I have a moral standard that if I'm contemptuous of someone because of their beliefs, I'm making a mistake. I need to go deeper, as you just did, yeah. and try to find the, the, the healthy core, which most people have, right. and go, in that healthy core, we have shared values. I have probably 85% of shared values with most Republicans. You know, we would, Absolutely. when we talk about core values, we're there. But I think I have one other responsibility, too. And that responsibility is... If we're if if I'm going to help herald in an integral age, which I want to do because I'm an evolutionary just like you, I have to recognize recognize that I can't just offer empathy and not expect empathy back. I have to understand the social dynamics of the the various groups and offer interventions that can support the evolutionary process rather than inhibit the evolutionary process. Um, we can expect the people across the aisle to be bipartisan. You know, I think that Biden, Biden should get all the, the, the most conservative billionaires in the country together and go negotiate with them. I think that he will have a much, <laughs> I, well, think here, I mean, forget I, about I, I the Republican what, legislatures. Well, yeah, the, I mean, the money in politics is uh, obscene and I grant you all of that. Yeah. I would say that one uh, example of that not working as planned is Trump. Himself, That's true. That's you know? so true. Good point. I mean, and and here's the other thing that and I think Mitch McConnell and all of those guys are afraid of their donors and all that's and, and that's yeah. how that's set up. But who else they're afraid of are their voters. Yeah, because, you know, they have to appeal to Republicans who now believe to 60 to 70 percent that the uh, election was a fraud. And so uh, they have to please those people. And. Um, and welcome to party politics. I, I don't know how much longer, uh, you know, it can go on in a way. I mean, or how much more polarized it can get. You know, I do see that there is, if, if we look at the field of human consciousness here in America, um, that, you know, we're now um, populating the 10 yard lines here. We got yeah, this exactly. Newsmax over here. Yeah who's like just Joe Biden, president? Ah, fuck, that can't be. It must be Trump. And just, just you know, asserting, not arguing, asserting. Yeah, asserting, no. asserting, not arguing. Exactly. And then over on the right, we have the gender flexible, this uh, the woke. And, and they're like full speed ahead like a train into the further progressiveness of, you know, everything and, and screwing that up. This is humans do when they're on the cutting edge. I mean, there's well, a lot know, on the table, it, 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 more on the table than ever. And I'm not sure that isn't the way of things, you know, that everybody gets to be seen and everybody gets to be, have their place on the field. Because it's not, I don't think these people have been created. They were there. That's one yes, of the arguments yes. I take to my liberal friends is that I grew up with these people. Who Me now too. Love Trump. Me too. You know, and so I know they were there all along. You know, they they never liked Walter Cronkite. <laughs> they they weren't for Woodstock. So I agree with you. Yeah. And so th to me, that's a strategic challenge as an integral person. I want to help that group grow, and I want and I I and I know it sounds condescending. I want to protect them as much as possible from doing too much damage to themselves, the country, yeah. and the environment. Yeah. 
And I have a responsibility to do it because I'm the person, the person with the deepest consciousness has the most responsibility. Yep. And, and I just happen to, you know, believe in all four quadrants. You, 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 you yep. know, science gives you a huge edge if you believe in it. Yeah. But it doesn't give you a huge edge. Totally. But getting back to persuasion, this is why I wanted to look at persuasion. Okay, what does science tell me about how to deal with these people? Okay, it's giving, giving facts to someone who finds facts not credible doesn't work. It just pisses them off, and then they go to contempt because I've been, I've been, I've been uh, categorically dismissed. Okay, so, so what does work? And so far, the only two things that I've seen are, one, you inch it forward like the Affordable Care Act and give people new rights that you can't take away. Okay, America's like that. You know, once you get some new rights, pretty much hard to take it away. Right. And I think the other part of it is when progressives are, are in charge, their job is to be reasonable, essentially to govern from the center, which was what Obama was doing, and to keep the campaign going day to day and not just talking to the, to the progressives. They should be campaigning to the to Republican electorate. We're trying to improve things for everybody. This is what we're doing. And we're doing our best to tell the truth. And if we screw up, we'll admit it. Um, because that's who we are. Trying to get them to have a sense of, my conservative brother said this about Biden. He said, I trust Biden. He said that four years ago. You know, Biden is someone that I might prefer. So I think that if the progressives change their strategies and start campaigning directly, and somebody made a great suggestion um, and i forget what the article he said take a hundred billion dollars because we're just spending money like water right now take and get pick 10 areas in 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 red states that are just being grindingly uh, um, impacted by uh, the new economy and by COVID, and create opportunity zones in the most disadvantaged places 10 billion dollars a place Put in education, put in infrastructure, put in um, new businesses, yeah. put in housing. Yeah. See, I like that, do that because, you know, even just using good old uh, integral theory from Claire Graves, uh, life conditions determine one's center of gravity of consciousness. Right. And right now, life conditions in a lot of these rural communities, and like where I come from, where there's half as many people there in a three thirty thousand person town than there was when I left in 1978. Wow. So everything's boarded up. The life conditions are actually have a quality of hunter gatherness to them, actually, because there aren't jobs where you get retirement and benefits and people are working two and three jobs and just trying to figure it out and make do and do this and do that. So that is, you know, th th that's not getting plugged into the modern world. Actually, I agree. Probably. I agree. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree with that. Yeah, and I was just talking to a, a friend of mine who has a big tech company down in Colorado Springs that's doing very, very well, and they have d developed a new initiative where they're opening, um, where where they're uh, recruiting and training people who live in these kind of forgotten towns throughout. They're all over America. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to leave these towns. They're not, they, they're not the people who wanted to strike out and, you know, make a life for themselves. They wanted to be with friends and family and God and country and the football team and all of that stuff. They want to be there. Yeah, uh, beautiful but, country. Totally. It's a great way places. of life. Yeah. And that's the other thing is that those of us who be, have, you know, been steeped and marinated in modernity and post-modernity, uh, we don't offer enough. There's no, it's soulless. To a, to, a, to a traditionalist, it's not enough, it's not appealing enough. Yeah. And so. Um, I, I agree with that also. I, yeah. I think urban environments, I personally am intimidated by urban in, environments. Yeah. And I, when I like, I, I, I mean, it's exciting to visit them, but I very quickly begin to get exhausted and start hungering for nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think there's a divide. There's communities where people, want to live, they want to have families, they want to have decent jobs. And, um, and so maybe there's a new, you know, thing that will happen in the lower right quadrants where, you know, this, this COVID thing is fast forward at us 10 years in terms of working at home. We're basically at 2030 and working at home. 
Well, yeah, you're, we'll see. you're talking to a guy that, that created his home office in 1989. I really <laughs> empathize. Yeah. I empathize with not wanting to move away from home. Yeah. I, and, you know, my, my, my clientele is not desperate. And they have different fears, okay? There's a real fear that the collective is so upset that it's, it's not just going to ask the, the top 1% or 2% to help. It's going to want to punish them. They're frightened of punitive actions, and and with with good reason, okay? Because there's a lot of progressives who are super pissed off about wealthy people, okay? And you know that's a thing too, um, and it, that that's not that's really not a good way to move forward right. to piss off the people that have all the money, yeah. you know? It, it's a it, it's a much better way to move forward to say, all right, you guys. You know, do it in a way where your friend is doing. Um, let's find a way to create more wealth and more well-being. And and this is back to my 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 friend Marcelo Cardoso's meta management model, where he sees that there are three things that come out of a company. You have whatever your product is, um, and and you have you know money. You have the welfare of the people who work in the company, and you have ecological benefit. He said that when a company is, or, and, and you have an organizing principle of the meaning of the company. He said companies that do that, and he has some good data about this, they tend to endure and they yeah. tend to thrive. Yeah. Okay? But that's adding those dimensions of the welfare of the people in the company and other people around them and the ecological benefit. Yeah. And don't you think that we are seeing that consciousness being raised in real time all over corporate America? I think so. Yeah, I do too. And I love uh, the businessmen I work with. They're, they're brilliant people and, yes. and very self-aware um, yes. and interested in growth. They, yeah, wanna, they want to evolve and they want their businesses to evolve. Yeah. And they've got to please their uh, employees. And this is, what the, this is a lot of the upside of woke is, you know, it's basically the installation of green, you know, egalitarianism, bringing in the marginalized, making them part of the system. Uh, Conversation is essentially... Um, been eliminated, real conversation between progressives and conservatives because that, that dynamic of you need to offer empathy without requiring empathy is just almost impossible to get unless you're teal. And so that's only 7% of the people that are going to get that. Yeah. And everybody else are just going to say, okay, I'm empathetic with you. Now you'd be empathetic with me. And they go, no, I can't be empathetic with you. You're limp-wristed, you know, yeah. fuck you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think that if that can become a standard, we offer empathy, but don't demand it back yeah. in dialogue. So now we can talk about politics. Now we can talk about religion. We can talk about abortion because I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm going to empathize with you, try to find some shared values, and I'm not going to demand it back. Yeah. And, I, and I think if that happens, that can soften some of the animosity. I don't think it's going to be softened from amber to green or even orange to green. I think it yeah. needs to be softened from green to amber, from green yeah, I do too. to orange. I do too. And I actually think what you're talking about is, um, again, just to use basic evolutionary theory, it's a way of us reintegrating the pre-modern mind. Yes. You know, and, the, and, and um, it, as we move into integral and realize that, yeah, we can't disenchant the world, you know, and expect people to come along. Uh, there has to be a re-enchantment and there has to be, you know, this, it's like, we have to resonate. If, even if we look at the stages, we, we want to resonate, first of all, with ourselves and be coherent as a person. We want our family, you know, then we want our community and then, and we want to have healthy, we want to vibrate healthy on those levels. And yes. then we want to vibrate healthy on the nation and then world and then cosmos. Actually, yes. um, and uh, the, we, a lot of those earlier family, sexual, you know, all of that's it's split off. It's distorted into porno and the sexual. It's a lot of there's a lot of integration of all of the juicy stuff that sort of chest below the chest or or you know belly and loins. Oh yeah, I'm there. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the boy that you're, you're hitting psychotherapy sweet belly really? and loins is the psychotherapy sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, right. <Man. laughs> because 
Um, you know, it's all screwed up down there. Uh, and, um, and so the part of turning towards that in a way where we see it more than it sees us, if you will, uh, is just part of the deal. You know, there's, it reminded me of a couple of sessions I had in the last, last week and a half. One was with a conservative woman, um, uh, a Republican, but, you know, my kind of Republican, you know. You know, someone who's thoughtful, gets irritated at all the extreme Peggy and Newman. stuff. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, and she likes ceremony. And so she gets together with her friends and creates these beautiful ceremonies where, where she connects everybody and she offers the icons and, and she directs them into the meditation and into the connection with the other world. And one of the pleasures of working with her is to help bring her into this archetype of the shaman that she's moving into as a Republican woman um, uh, talking with me because I'm a progressive. We have fun conversations. Okay, so that, that's the re-enchantment. Yes. Bring that in. Hallelujah. I want that. I want that. I want everybody to love each other. I want that in service of my integral moral sense. Yes. And then that organizes everybody. Um, and, and so I want to help everybody do that because I know from the research and as a psychotherapist, that's where evolution takes the individual ontologically and it's taking the species and the world phylogenetically. Um, right on. Well, you know, it, it sort of it, it takes me back to the beginning of our conversation where I talked about I'm, 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 I'm afraid, you know, and, I, and, and I, I, I hate this psychopath in the White House. And I don't like to say, think that I hate somebody or I'm afraid of somebody. But you know what? Maybe it's okay. Of course. Maybe that's just activating my red that yes. uh, it doesn't have to be explained away by my orange. Well, yes. And I, I think that's an appropriate response. Yes. And that so it's us. appropriate to have fear and loathing for such a person. And well, to even nurture it in a way that's not corrosive, I suppose, no. right? You don't want to suffer, but you want it to make take a moral stand. It yeah. is immoral to do what he's. I don't want to feel moral outrage in terms of let it screw up my metabolism, right. but I want to feel it strategically in terms of it informs me about where the rattlesnakes are in the field. Okay, yeah, he's a rattlesnake, and there's a whole bunch of people probably about 20 or 30 percent of the electorate that'll step on that rattlesnake and, and, because they can't see it and a few like COVID is a perfect metaphor for this okay perfect metaphor um the the idea of hospitals being overwhelmed I, I this is another story so a client of mine had to go to Atlanta she had so she said I made the mistake of flying from Santa Barbara I was on an American flight packed nobody wearing their mask and it went to red states. First, it went to Phoenix. Nobody wearing a mask. People doing karaoke, karaoke at three o'clock, singing at each other in a bar. Then I went to Dallas. Nobody wearing a mask. Then I went to Atlanta. In Atlanta, she talked to the conservatives there. She's a business person. They said, well, the only reason that Atlanta voted for Biden is it's just because they took the people inside the beltway. Okay, that's code in Atlanta for the black people. Okay. So she just had one experience after another of politics telling these people, you're probably not going to die, so fuck everybody. And you know, because you're not wearing a mask and you're doing all this stuff, that maybe somebody's grandfather is going to end up dying 10 years early. It doesn't really matter, does it? It's not your grandfather. And if it's your grandfather, that's just bad luck, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. So we're seeing that, that idea uh, that, 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 that belief system, if the, if, the, if the negative consequence isn't in my face, I can comfortably deny it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you know, if you have, um, if, again, if you're pre-modern or pre-rational in your heart, if, what, what, you, what you have is a grand story. What you have is a grand myth and all the characters, and you're a character in this grand myth. And, and it, there's a great beauty to that, of course. Mm. Uh, but the, the, one of the downsides is you see uh, the story that comes out of modernity, which is actually based on science and facts and logic and reason. You see that's just another story, too, because you can't see the qualitative difference. Yeah. You know? 
Well, and also, you know, God taking care of me and, you know, and us being a chosen people and all that stuff is a lot more attractive than geek scientists to most no people. No kidding. Are you know, kidding? like I happen to like geek scientists, but they're not very charismatic. Well, yes. You know, they're not very enchanted. I mean, no. you know, like, like that's what I loved about these truth guys, you know, like these deception guys. They're just such pure geeks. Um, but, you know, that's, there, there's not now. Now, if you add the hero's journey into that, if I took either one of these geeks and I talked about their journey through academia to be able to come up with their theories that went against established theories, where they had to fight for their theories and they had to stand up for what they believed was right and the data supported and all that kind of stuff, it becomes really heroic and interesting and fascinating and exciting. Yeah. You're basically giving them, or you're re-enchanting their lives yeah. to do yeah. that. You and know, that's my job their life if I'm has, their therapist. Absolutely. And that's one of Integral's jobs is to re-enchant the poor modernity, <laughs> right, right. completely anxious and neurotic because it doesn't know what's going on, uh, <laughs> you know, except that it knows all its facts. It knows everything that's going on and nothing at the same time. And uh, so, you know, welcome to evolution. But Jesus Christ, Keith, talk about making me neurotic. Oh God! Well, you know, aye, aye. it's so much. It's so much better knowing that Biden is going to be. He's going to pick a lot of great people, and, and good things are going to happen. He's going to be president, right, Keith? Oh I mean, yes. This, this Trump will actually have to leave, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's. It, this is where we're seeing the American inst. You know, Trump, in spite of himself, weirdly unintended consequences. Because of all his stuff about phony elections and, and stuff, all the states were paying attention to that. And the election people were challenged. And, you know, with the masculine, loving challenge and challenge really gets ma the masculine activated. So the masculine and everybody said, we're going to have a, we're going to have a Republican and we're going to have a re a Democrat observers, and we're going to do it right, and we're going to get our computers set up, we're going to do that, da, 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 probably the least corrupt election ever in American history, certainly the most turnout. So Trump created a lot of interest in civic uh, things. No, I know, that's true. No, <laughs> so, no, no really. I mean, we've learned so much of this is, this is actually the hidden gem is that, first of all, our election system will be even better next time. Yeah. After this. yeah. And we've learned so much about all of it. Uh, but, um, you know, I, it's going to be okay, Jeff. Yeah. I mean, I tell my, it's going to be president. okay all the time, but I have to ask you to reassure me, Jeff, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Usually you're the one reassuring me. So I'm, I'm right, so I've been right all along. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> You've been right all along. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be really good. And you know, I love how Democrats are feeling like you're feeling and I'm feeling I'm not, I don't feel a particular sense of triumph. I feel a sense of relief, and, my, and the work has started. Yeah. My, my job is to help heal this country. Aww. And to do that, I have to heal myself. i got to yep. find my own racism and heal it. i got to find my own contempt for conservatives and heal it. I've got to advocate for what I think actually will work in terms of moving things forward. Um, that's my job. I'm mobilized. I feel like I feel like I've been called essentially by this election. Never felt that. I didn't feel that after Clinton. Didn't feel like that after Obama. I felt, oh boy, now everything's going to be taken care of. Don't feel that this time. I feel like relief, and I feel okay. Well, there's a lot of work ahead. Um, oh my goodness gracious! Well, how beautifully said is that? And I think maybe we just leave that as the last word. Okay, folks, see you next time in the next episode of The Shrink and the Pundit. <laughs>